folks that are just arriving, if you guys want to come in, there are still a fair amount of seats inside here. So we prefer not to have you stand out in the hallway. Of course, it's a lot easier to see the images that are on the screen if you come on in. So some folks that are in the hallway out there, if you're familiar with the high school here, around the corner here, down the hallway, and into the commons area, there is a uh, television set in there. This is being live streamed uh, thank to, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Channel V6. Um, and in that commons area, they do have a large television. So if you prefer to go in there rather than stand out in the hall, uh, that would be a great place to, to see what's going on as well, too. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Brian Harris, and I'm the information officer with the Type 1 Incident Management Team uh, that's here managing the fire at this point in time. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so live stream, let me cover that real quick. Um, so pull up a URL. It's www. Spell out channel, and then V and the number six dot com. I'll say it again, www channel v the number six dot com. Okay, as I said, I'm the information officer for the uh, uh, incident management team that's here tonight and I'll facilitate this meeting for you. Um, we view this really as, this is your meeting. This is your meeting to find out the information that's going on on this fire um, from the start of it up to operations that are going on today. Okay, I'm gonna take just a minute or so and explain a little bit about um, the inner, act, the inner uh, agency uh, activity that comes together to manage a wildfire. So as we know, this uh, fire started on Monday. It was reported at approximately at one o'clock in the afternoon, okay? Did I say Monday? Thank you. Thank you for correcting me, okay? You know, the funny thing is that when we do fire like this, we lose track of the days, yeah. So thank you for correcting me on Sunday. Uh, when, a, when a fire is reported, some entity is responsible for what we call initial attack. So who was responsible any for initial attack? Okay. Oh, over here, I'm sorry, yes, over here. With the county at that point in time, okay? Um, so, so when we talk about fire management on different jurisdiction of land, so when we talk about private land, um, the county has a, has a responsibility for that. Okay, when we talk about state land, then the state has a responsibility for that. When we talk about Forest Service land, of course the Forest Service does. Uh, when we talk about reservation land, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has a responsibility for that. So they conduct what we call an initial attack of that fire. An aggressive initial attack. Firefighters on the ground, available resources, hit that as hard as they can with the intent of putting it out in that first burning period. Now, sometimes we don't get it out in that first burning period, and it burns through the night. Uh, when it does burn through the night, it's kind of a regrouping time frame. Let's get more firefighters. Let's get people rolling this direction. Um, we are able to share resources at that point in time. 
Okay, when the county calls for help from the, from the state, they're there to help and send resources. Uh, the same thing applies to the Forest Service and to BIA as well. Um, so the second day of a fire is kind of what we move, we call it, we move into an extended initial attack, okay? So again, we're trying to hit that fire as hard as we can and put it out as quickly as we can. Um, at some point, based on the fire intensity, what's going on in that fire, we're gonna make this what we call essentially a project fire. Um, and that's when the agencies that are involved start consider bringing in incident management teams, okay? So a type two incident management team was brought in first and then followed by a type one team. Um, so I'm just gonna explain briefly about what the difference of those are. Now those incident management teams are interagency. For example, I'm a Forest Service employee and I work on the Payette National Forest in central Idaho. If we went down through the members of our team, we come from Forest Service BLM, from the BIA, from just about any entity at the federal level you can think of, but we also go in to bring resources out at the county level, so Boise County, Ada County, for example, but also down at the local fire department level too. So we have fire uh, uh, subject matter experts here from, for example, the city of Reno, uh, the fire department in the city of Reno. So we come together as a team and come and assist. The intent of bringing a team in is to turn that fire over to us so we can manage that fire for them so that they can regroup and kind of refocus on what happens if another fire starts so that they're then prepared to pick up another fire start if that should happen, you know, let's just say, for example, 15 miles away, but still within the county's jurisdiction. Um, so it's kind of the relief of the local firefighters. Let them fall back to their station, get some showers, get some sleep, and get ready for the next fire. And then the incident management team will manage the bigger project fire uh, for the local jurisdictions. Uh, some folks have asked me what's the difference between a type one and a type two team. So there's really not much difference as far as the basic organization of those teams. Usually a type one team is a little larger. Um, I did this the other night. Uh, Anybody here with military experience? Okay, so I'll talk in military terms real quick. So I kind of view a type two team of professionals kind of as, as a battalion uh, command level, okay? So they're ready to come in and take fires and take on as many as say 1,200 firefighters, for example. They can still deal with a large fire. They bring a little bit less numbers than the type one team does. So I kind of view a type one team as a brigade level of command and control. So a bigger organization, we do tend to have a little grayer hair at the type one level, okay? Because we've been doing it a little bit longer, all right? Uh, but the experience level and the professional uh, firefighting expertise at the type one team and the type two teams are really the same. It's just how we're dividing those teams up and then deploying them out there wherever that fire happens to be. So that's kind of the incident management system. Um, shared resources, like for example, the, uh, the assets uh, that are on this fire are coming from all over the country right now. We have the Dalton Hotshots from California. Uh, we have uh, hotshot crews from Idaho. Uh, we have uh, single resource people like an information officer coming out of Pennsylvania. So there's an awful lot of people that are focusing, bringing into this area to fight the fire, to help manage the fire, and help share information about what's going on with the fire. Okay, so that's kind of a general overview about fire operations and how things are done. So we're gonna jump into an operations. Let's get to this fire. That's what you guys came here for is let's get the information on this fire of what's taking place on the Dollar Ridge fire. So the first person I'm gonna introduce is Mark Kuntz and he's one of our operations officer with the type one team. Uh, our operations folks are the firefighters. They're the ones out there on the ground that are making things happen out there. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and he's gonna go through this map right here, kind of what we call once around the horn. You know, what's going on on this fire at different places, uh, the activities that they took place today, and he'll fill in a lot of gaps in information. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark at this time. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Brian said, my name is Mark Kuntz, and my role on this fire is planning operations, which involves um, taking all those resources that Brian was talking about and getting those organized into different divisions on the fire, which I'll go through right now, um, and kind of explain what happened over the last 24 hours and what we're looking at uh, moving into the next uh, operational period uh, tomorrow and tomorrow night. So we'll go ahead and uh, 
start up here, and I'm going to start up here at the top because I think this is probably generating the most interest at this point. Uh, yesterday, um, I think a lot of folks may have seen the column that was coming up off the fire, and we had a pretty good south wind that uh, impacted the fire and pushed the fire north, and it wound up crossing Highway 40 right in this area here near Current Creek. Um, as of right now, the area that slopped over uh, Highway 40 is about 500 acres in size. It grew a little bit today. Um, the focus at this point is um, to make sure we keep it all west of Current Creek. So we've got resources working up Current Creek and then trying to wrap around the top of it and bring it back down and tie it into Highway 40. Just to lock that off and get that good and secure so it doesn't spread any further. Along that same line, as it pushed up yesterday, as you notice, it kind of fingered up a little bit in this area right here. Uh, it didn't cross Highway 40 in this area, but the next uh, area of priority for us and focus is to begin to come down this edge right here and tie it into some uh, dozer and hand lines that's already been constructed over in this area right here. And the idea behind doing this, and we, we kind of call this area in here the horseshoe, um, and the idea is with the, the typical winds in the area coming out of the southwest, um, is if we can secure that edge right there, um, then that prevents um, any more impact to all the, the structures and homes and things like that south of Highway 40 moving off to the east. So trying to get that all locked down. As we move around um, to the east side, coming down the Little Red Creek Road towards uh, uh, Pinnacles and Sherwood, and there's a lot of different names for places out here I've learned. <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm getting them all right either. So the focus over in this area, down coming down um, Red Creek, has been to get that road prepped um, in behind all the structures down in there. And um, once we've done that, get some uh, uh, sprinklers and hose and things like that in there and get it set. So it gives us a couple of options. If the fire decides to push hard down at the, at the road, you know, we can, we can burn off the line we put in um, down at the toe of the slope and kind of control what's coming down off the hill. Um, or we can just let it, you know, if it decides to back down slowly, it gives us some place to pick it up and just kind of work the edge as it goes. So um, we'll get that uh, finished up like that and it'll give us some options moving forward in the future. Coming around over here into uh, this area down here by uh, Sherwood and Pinnacles, um, those were a couple of slops that uh, occurred a couple of days ago. Um, those have, the firefighters have gone in. They've gotten those uh, lined and secured, and they're feeling really good about where those are right now. Um, so they're starting to uh, now focus some efforts over here, coming down around the, the south side, moving off toward the west. Um, figuring out what, uh, what some access into this area is and what the best plan is, whether that's if they can get right up on the fire edge or if they need to back off a little bit and kind of go indirect. Um, so they're working on that right now. They have gotten access down in this uh, timber Canyon Road. I think I got that right. Um, we know that there's some values down in there. They've gone in there, kind of assessed the situation down in there, and are beginning to kind of prep that road a little bit as another place to hold the fire if it were to start to move um, off to the southeast. As you kind of work your way back around through Division Zulu or Division Z off to this uh, west end, we did have a little growth yesterday um, down in this area when, when that wind event hit, happened up here. Um, so this is kind of, this is what we picked up yesterday in the, the little spot out here. So we've got resources over here in Division Alpha that are beginning to kind of scout this out and figure out how, that they, how they can tie this back in. At the same time, we've got resources working on coming down this edge um, through some of the more open country and lock that in that way. So that's kind of the, the big picture as far as um, what we're planning for. Uh, as Brian mentioned, um, you know, a lot of resources come together to make this happen. And I know on the top of the left of the sheet you have, there's a, a lot of resources on there. Uh, we've been continuing to get more resources in. Um, so we're starting to feel pretty good about that at this point and uh, where we're headed. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, now, I know there might be a few questions or so based on what operations we got going out there. But as you guys can tell, and I see the the fans being made, it's getting hot in here already. Um, so let us get through the presentation real quick. I, I, I won't guarantee it, but I think a lot of your questions will be answered by the folks that we do have up here that are gonna come up and speak actually. Um, and then after that, if there's a few questions and stuff, we'll certainly take those questions as well too.
Okay? So I'd like to turn it over right now. Any operation that has a lot of inherent danger to it, such as fighting fire, has got to have somebody who's in, who's in charge. Um, so I'd like to introduce Tony DeMasters. He's our incident commander for the fire. All right, there we go. All right, good evening, everybody. Again, like Brian said, uh, I'm the incident commander for this uh, Great Basin Incident Management Team. Um, and so with that, I want to kind of explain a little bit and just tag on to what Brian was talking about is, you know, what is an incident management team? What do we do? And what are, where are we going into the future with this? So when an incident management team comes in to, to manage an incident like this, we work for somebody, and so our delegation of authority is who our bosses are, who we work for to manage this incident is the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the state, as well as the Forest Service. And so this delegation of authority is basically our marching orders, saying this is what we need to do and how are we going to do it. And so as an incident management team, myself, my staff, operations folks, but also too working with the agency administrators, working with the county commissioners, working with all of our partners, the primary job for the incident management team is to bring organization to chaos, okay? This thing's a mess, and so we're trying to bring organization to what's going on out there. And so in turn to that is our number one priority is the safety of our responders as well as to the public. For those that are in and around the area that live directly immediate to the fire's edge, but also to folks that live and have values out here. That's our number one objective, is firefighter and public safety. Okay, outside of that, incident management team, we're managing risk. So by meaning managed risk is, like Mark was saying, we use aircraft, we use heavy equipment, we use hand crews and engines, we use everything that's in the toolbox to manage this incident, but in the same breath, we're managing risk because we don't want to put our firefighters in any undue risk putting firefighters out here in front of the head of this fire, okay? So that's our number one priority. So along with that is, I wanna go into what we are doing and where we're going into the future. So with this, I need to change hands here. So tactically and strategically is that where we're going into the future is that we're thinking out ahead. So this thing started Sunday, and this thing moved three to five miles from the west, moving its way east. Okay, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it moved another almost five miles. Okay, so you can see the progression. Yesterday, it moved almost four miles, if not five miles, from the old existing perimeter, moved in its way north. So this thing has the ability to move a great distance in a short amount of time. And so that's why we need to be thinking very strategically as far as a plan of attack, where we're putting our resources, our firefighters, and using our aviation assets to the best of our ability because this thing has the ability to move all directions at any given time. And that's one due to the existing fuel conditions out there. The existing fuel conditions out there are just tender, dry. Any spot that lands on the, on the ground and it has the ability to take fire, it's taken fire. Okay, we have the winds. The winds have not been favorable for us. And also, too, looking into the future, we got at least the next two to four days of the same type of weather that's lining up with us. And so we're taking small bites of this event, this incident, and trying to protect, one, the values at risk, like Mark was explaining, we're trying to get this stuff secured here to protect the prevailing winds coming out of the southwest and trying to lock this down so that we prevent no more spread into the values at risk, the homes, the infrastructure, the power lines, Highway 40, okay? So that's where we're kind of going into the future and we're thinking big box. If this thing continues to move, then we're thinking, okay, what's this gonna do to the south? Right now, there's no values at risk, right now. But it, over, excuse me, over time, this fire will continue to grow and we're gonna have to do something with it. But first and foremost, we as an incident management team working with the agency administrators, right here is our priority. 
we want to lock this thing down. We want to put it in a headlock so that way the prevailing winds don't get in behind it and create another fire front to where this continues to burn and we lose values. As I know some of those values is some of your dwellings, some of your structures, homes. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, at the end here, I'll be more than happy to field any uh, questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, as Tony mentioned, the delegation of authority uh, comes from the, from the federal and the state level uh, government organizations that have, again, responsibility for the fire. Uh, so we have uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, we have uh, 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 Antonio Pingree is here. Um, Antonio's gonna be here to answer any questions you might have for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, Mike Erickson is here from the uh, uh, Utah State of De uh, Department of Natural Resources and then Jeff Schramm from the Ashley National Forest. So Mike, you're up this point and give us a perspective from the state of Utah, thank you. Uh, Mike Erickson, uh, area manager for uh, the Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands, um, also the agency administrator uh, representing the state of Utah in cooperation with our, our two counties that are involved with this fire, Wasatch and Duchesne County. Um, and our, our primary responsibility is obviously private, state and private lands uh, and the protection of those values that are, are on those lands. Um, and I, I just want to start off that, uh, with the caveat that um, I don't, I've never been evacuated from a home. Um, I've never been chased out by a fire. Um, and so I might not be able to understand uh, where you're coming from um, in the situations that, that you guys are in. But I can tell you I've got two employees of mine who are firefighters here in Fruitland and one of them has been evacuated. Uh, and I'm concerned for them and their families. And just like I'm sure all of you are with your neighbors, I'd just like to share a, a real quick story, uh, a, a, something that happened to me last night. Uh, I was in the IC and uh, there was an individual there, a gentleman who was talking to the incident commander um, and asking him, he had some concerns. Uh, he had some chickens that he was worried about. You know, he'd been evacuated. They weren't getting any food or water. Uh, the incident commander was talking to him. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go over and help him out, see if I can help this individual out. Um, and went down, got the information from him. Oh, he's right there. Um, and thought I'm going out that way, I'll, I'll go see if I can let his chickens out or give them some water. And as I went down the road, I got to the point where his house was and uh, his chicken coop was fine. Somebody else had come by and I think let the chickens out, but his house was gone. And at that point I, I knew, I, I, I told him I'd call him back and uh, had to sit there for a minute and kind of compose myself. Um, it wasn't my home. But I want to let you know that as firefighters, we have a, we're very aware of that these are people's homes. We all live somewhere. And I think we can understand maybe a little bit as we think about what would happen, what, how we would feel if, if that were our home. Um, and I, I know we've lost some homes on, on this, this fire, uh, but I'm very grateful that we haven't lost a life. Uh, we've had our, our sheriffs, the de and, and his deputies in both counties who have helped out with evacuations. Um, and our firefighters, I, I wanna let you know, are doing the very best that they can uh, to, to make your home safe again. And we wanna get you back in there as soon as possible, but we don't know when that is. There's still a whole lot of, of threats and things out there that we need to improve so that you guys can get back into your homes. Um, Again, I want to let you know that they're doing the best they can, and uh, please be patient with us as firefighters. If you come up to us and, and you're concerned with something, we're going to do our best to answer your question and try and address your need. But our main focus right now is, is that fire, and, uh, and we're going to do the best we can to, to try and catch that. Thank you, Mike. All right, next up is uh, Jeff Schramm, who's the forest supervisor uh, for the Ashley National Forest. Thanks, Jeff. First off, I'd like to thank you for coming tonight, and I'll be available afterwards. If there's any questions that you have regarding the Forest Service, be more than willing to stay as long as we need to to answer those. 
What I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about was as far as the Forest Service properties, the area there in green. And as Tony had mentioned, when we looked at this fire, we said, where's the values that we see are the highest at risk? And we felt that was not on the Forest Service at this time. So we asked the team to focus their efforts outside of the Forest Service. We have been monitoring the Forest Service property. We've had folks up there monitoring that, but we haven't put a lot of firefighters up there because our emphasis, again, was down where we feel those values at risk are. The, the fire that we did have, the first day made a fairly large run, second day made a big run. It burnt fairly hot across that Forest Service land. Since then, it's been more of what we call a backing fire. So the wind is blowing it onto the fire and it's causing it to go, the fire is burning uphill with the wind pushing it. So where it's burning on that national forest land, it's been fairly slow moving up. The one day after the first initial big runs, about the third day, uh, the acreage on the national forest land increased about 1,300 acres was all. And so we haven't had a lot of activity on the national forest lands. And so as we move further in, once, once the team gets it secured down there where we have those higher values at risk, then we'll start looking at how we're going to deal with it up on the national forest. And what we'll do is we'll look at what's the best location for us to hold it and provide for those firefighters safety. And that may be required that we do some additional burning out to pull it up to a ridge or whatever it may be. But that'll be later on as we get further into this operation, once we feel that other area is secure. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening over on the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest, which is on the strawberry side. I was out there yesterday, and as that fire started making its way further up towards the dam, required that some of those areas were evacuated. So we do, even though the fire hasn't been on National Forest land up on that end, it has resulted in the campground there has been closed, impacts on the marina there at Aspen Grove. And so there has been additional impacts up on that Strawberry River side. But those are the two key items that I wanted to mention to you tonight. Again, there's myself here and a couple of my staff. If you have any questions regarding National Forest Land, we'd be more than willing to answer those. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so we've heard from, uh, from, from kind of, you know, the federal government levels, the state government levels. Um, so, you know, come here with a, uh, and given a delegation to, of this team to, to really aggressively attack this fire. But I tell you, you know, I don't think there's any other organization out there other than the United States, you know, the, really the fire service that really pulls together at all levels of government, from federal down to state, and then our key people that are really making things happen on the ground are the county folks. Um, so at this point, we're going to turn it over first to Wasatch County. As you guys know, this, this fire is burning in two counties. Wasatch County and Duchesne County as well. Um, so first up, we're going to go with Wash, uh, Wasatch County and uh, give uh, Jared Rigby, who's the Chief Deputy of Wasatch County, uh, opportunity to speak as well. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. I wanted to take uh, just a few minutes. And, and first of all, I wanted to, uh, maybe some of you know this already, uh, but uh, you've got a great Sheriff's Office here in Duchesne County. And... Uh, I think we've got a pretty darn good one in Wasatch, but uh, you guys really do. Maybe some of you are already aware, but uh, on the first day we were evacuating in Fruitland, uh, there were a couple deputies that kind of got themselves in, into uh, a pretty tight spot. And if you haven't heard about that yet, I'd ask around about it. It's kind of their story to tell. But uh, I want you to know that they, they stayed until uh, the very last minute, and uh, probably longer than they should have, and uh, they put their, their own lives in jeopardy. And uh, our search and rescue team and our deputies were there as well, and uh, had the privilege of helping some with that a little bit. And uh, Sheriff Boren and uh, all of his staff, they really do care about you. They're really doing everything they can. So uh, thank you for supporting him. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that as far as in Wasatch County, and uh, part of the reason for this is because uh, it's, it's being recorded and, and there's some media here and, and uh, there are some folks, I'm sure, from Wasatch or have interests uh, in Wasatch County uh, that, that would like to know some things. Our first concerns uh, in Wasatch had to do with uh, the life and safety of uh, residents and, and those visiting in uh, the Pine Hollow area, and also uh, 40 Dam Acres. That's a great name. 
and uh, also at the Aspen Grove Campground. So uh, those areas have been evacuated also, just like uh, a lot of you here. Uh, mandatory evacuations, we're holding those uh, at the SR-40 and the, the Aspen Grove turn. And, uh, and a lot of them haven't been able to get in, uh, just the same uh, as you since then. And so uh, for any of them that are here or listening, uh, we're working to make that possible as, as soon as we can. Uh, our deputies really do care. Our fire people uh, really, this comes up in, in all of our discussions in every one of our meetings of uh, how soon can we get them in, how soon can we get 40 opened, all of those things. We're working to get those answers for you. I don't have them for you uh, right now this minute, but uh, they're at the front of our minds, uh, the safe, your safety, the safety of our people, and just so much appreciate your guys' support. We're here for questions, both during the meeting and afterwards. Uh, Troy Morgan's here, our fire warden. you have anything to add right now, or are you good? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Jared. Um, Commissioner, you're up next. Um, so go ahead and stand up. From Duce, Shane County, we have Commissioner uh, Greg Todd. And, and Greg, go ahead and introduce the folks that are with you as well, too. Okay. Hi, I'm Commissioner Greg Todd. And uh, this is a great crowd. We appreciate you being here, uh, wanting to learn of the situation that has, has affected all of us. Uh, this is Sheriff Boren with us and Mike Leffler is here and they'll both speak. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I hope you smile because if you don't, I'm gonna cry. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's a tough thing. Uh, this is my first experience as a commissioner to, to see this fire and how it worked and how the coordination went. And I wanna tell you, each of you that working with the, the, the Fed bunch and the state bunch and the counties has been a great experience, a very good experience. We've worked together, we've communicated, we've made decisions together, and we've followed up. It's been a really good experience. And that will continue as we go through the next time period, whatever it takes to, to fix the problem that we all are, are experiencing. Um, I've got to tell you, we went on a reconnaissance today and we found a few chickens alive. And we know where to, we didn't know who to give them to. And you're here and we'll let you know. So, uh, amazing. <laughs> so, just to follow up from the story from Mr. Erickson, we did find uh, some, some chickens. I also want to recognize a, a couple of people here. We have Logan Wild. He was here. He's one of our representatives, state representatives. And we also have Christine Watkins, and you're here in the audience somewhere. They're represent us, representing us here at, uh, as state representatives, and we're appreciative of them. Uh, Kevin Van Tassel's been here several times in some of the conversations and the meetings that we've had also. And many of you know that the, the governor came and he flew in and spent some time and had an opportunity to really see what was going on and, and gave us some encouragement as, as commissioners to, to do things better, to look at things that we can do to, to improve our situation here. Also, just for your information today, uh, I have a connection with Mitt Romney and they called and they said, can we come and just take a look? And they did and they met with the incident commander. They were able to talk to Sheriff Bourne and actually was able to go to Current, Current Creek and see what had happened as it went up the canyon. And it was, it was a way of looking to see what, as a federal government, they could do things better. So I was appreciative of that. Um, I kind of have notes. Um, first, of, one other thing I want to bring up. As the county, we have established a fund. It's called the, the Dollar Ridge Victim Fund. And it's in Mountain America. You could go anywhere there and it's already been put together on our website, the Duchesne County website. So if you would let your friends that want to help, that want to participate, it's going out live uh, statewide in a lot of these things. And there, I've had people, I had a commissioner from Box Elder call, County call me just a couple of, just before this meeting and said, what can we do? 
uh, commissioners from all, all over the state have called and said, we, we feel your pain, and many of them have had similar experiences that we are going through right now. <laughs> Those have been evacuated. There's a process that, that happens, and I hope you understand that it's, it's a very controlled, thoughtful process. So uh, when we have a, a recommendation from, from the incident commander, we look at it, the sheriff makes a decision, he decides what we need to do. Within 36 hours, if I, if, as the commission, we feel we need to follow what happens, we do an order. And then that, as within that order, we send it, I sign it, it goes to uh, the, the county, it's separated or dispersed to everywhere in the state so everyone knows about it. We've had to do that three times. We're hoping sometime soon we can resend some of those and get you back home. But that's the way it works, and it's organized and controlled, and we, I respect that, and I think it's a good process. Um, you know, the economics of this is, is something that we always have to look at also. You know, we've talked about the, you know, the trucks, the oil trucks going, and we also have other situations with, with farmers and ranchers and, and you know, even uh, various businesses within our community that's affected by it. And we, we hurt and we understand that. We want all of us to succeed, all of us to take uh, control of our lives. And sometimes when that control is taken away, it's really, really frustrating. Last that I'd like to say is clap for yourselves. The, the people that have come, they've been amazed at the support from the community, from the surrounding areas. It's a great thing, and it's something that you've developed over the years to help each other out. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd just like to uh, thank you very much for all the outpouring of support that you've had for uh, my office, uh, for our search and rescue and all of our volunteers. Uh, there's been uh, a load of water, uh, uh, fluids, and uh, food brought out to our command post that's manned out in uh, by the Tabby Rest area, and uh, we haven't had to worry about that. You've, you've taken care of us well. and, and uh, I've really appreciated the fact that you've taken care of, of each other. As I uh, finally got the opportunity to come in yesterday and take a tour through the school and see the humanitarian aids that has been going on there, I got a little choked up. And uh, you know, it wasn't a, uh, a big federal government aid that, that come in and, and dropped all of this stuff off and, and, and took care of you. It was, it was your community. It was individuals that were donating to, to you for your behalf and trying to take care of you. And that's the way it should be. We should take care of each other. Uh, and, and I was really pleased to see what was going on. I was really impressed. It was organized. And, and, and that was a great relief to us because we didn't have to worry about that portion of what was happening. And it, and it gave us the opportunity to focus back on our tasks, which is uh, our, my number one responsibility in the county is public safety. Uh, the second thing is the protection of your property. And so as uh, this fire started, obviously we want to protect, protect you. And second, your belongings. Uh, unlike Mike, uh, who said he hadn't been through an evacuation personally before I have. Um, when I was a young man, just after I was married, we got evacuated. We had a farm, um, we had livestock, we had hay that we were putting up, we had fields that we were irrigating, and, and we had to go. And we were out for several days, and uh, you know, we had medications that we needed to get for our, our aging parents and, and things. And so I, I know exactly where you're at, and I understand. I understand your needs to get back in there and take care of your animals, and the needs to get back and get your, your medication, and to deal with your water turns that are few and far between now. And, and so I understand that. Um, but also understand that 
that they're things. It's our property. And uh, a few years ago when we had the Neola North fire, um, there was a couple of individuals in there, they were friends of mine, that got caught in there. They thought that they could, uh, we had time to, uh, to do a few things uh, around the property there and they got caught and they were killed. And uh, so I was determined uh, during this fire that we weren't going to lose anyone. And uh, that almost happened with two of my deputies. We, uh, we were scrambling at the last minute, trying to, to get to all of the structures out on uh, Current Creek Mountain. And you're from there, so you know there's a lot of them. A lot of hooked roads and dead ends, and, and they got caught behind the fire line. Fire rolled in behind them, and they got, they got stranded and had to evacuate their vehicles and, and uh, hike a real steep ridge and, and be picked up, picked up by a couple of other deputies. It was a good turnout, but it was, it was definitely a scare for us in Wasatch County as we sat down in the bottom and started ordering helicopters to help try to retrieve them. So it's just, a, I guess, a little bit of a reality check for us that things can happen, and they can happen quickly. And so as far as evacuations, uh, we receive, uh, we have what we call uh, trigger points as this fire progresses, and uh, it gets to a certain point, we get a a notification from incident command uh, saying that we need to uh, evacuate this area and what we've tried to do is try to stay a little bit ahead of that because we don't want to get caught behind the line and we don't want you to get caught behind the line so it seems like the, we're way out in front of maybe maybe over extending where we we need to but we're really not as we've watched this fire jump from ridge top to ridge top uh, it, this doesn't have to burn through an area it can uh, ignite in one spot, jump a ridge half a mile away and ignite again. And so we don't want any of you to get caught behind the line or put our, uh, our personnel in jeopardy having to uh, skate around there at the last minute and, and try to help you get out of there. So the plan that we had in place was we identified uh, areas where there were trigger points. And when we hit those trigger points, the incident command would notify us we would evacuate that area. But we tried to give you a, a little bit of a heads up. Initially, we couldn't. It was coming, we had to do what we could. What we could. But as things kind of progressed and we got ahead of it a little bit, we were able to go in there in, a, in an area that we've identified and say, okay, if it starts to encroach into this area, we're gonna evacuate the next one so that we're not scrambling. We'll give that next one a heads up. Make sure that you're ready to go, because we don't know you could be evacuated. I hope that's been a help to you, to give you a little bit of a heads up to, to, get, to get some of your, you know, your family heirlooms or your personal papers and stuff out of there. Um, I realize that, you know, as, uh, as we can, we've tried to accommodate you in getting to some, some back in there, taking care of some of your animals and getting some of your, you know, your essentials and your personal property out. I hope that's been helpful to you. We've done that two days in a row and uh, tried to help you get back in there and, it, and it's worked uh, pretty well. Um, being an old farm boy, I know that hay needs to be bailed and cows need to be tended to and the dogs need to be fed and stuff and so we've tried to accommodate you as best as we can but we want to make sure that you're safe in doing that and it seems like maybe we're a little extreme sometimes but forgive us. We're trying to look out for your best interest and uh, not get anybody hurt. And so the plan for the future is uh, that we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're looking at that north side of the Highway 40, back east from Current Creek. That's our area of responsibility. And uh, so we give a, uh, a warning last night as it jumped the highway and headed up Current Creek that we ha might have to evacuate that area just east of, of Current Creek Road just to give a heads up, you know. We don't want to get scrambling. It's easier to, to take it a little bit more easy and do it at leisure than it is to run around and, and try to do it right now. Then we're putting everybody in jeopardy. So we give them the heads up. I hope we don't have to evacuate. That would be our fourth evacuation. And I hope we don't have to do that. We're crossing our fingers that they can hold the line there and, and let's not have a problem. If that happens, 
We'll continue down the north side as we, similar to what we did on the south side of the road, section by section, and try to give you as much heads up as we can to, to, to get out of there uh, and get your stuff. Because when we pull the trigger on it, we all, it it's right now. And then, then you don't have any time. We, we need you out of there right now. So, so we've tried to give you as much time. That'll progress like that if, if the fire progresses to the point where we're there. Um, the individuals and the properties are ev that are evacuated on the south side right now. The ones that are closest to Current Creek out to the lower Red Creek Road is some of the most uh, critical right now as far as fire danger to you. Um, and so we've allowed some individuals to go back. We've identified a time between, sometime between 10 and 1 to have you kind of go back in there and take care of some things as you could and, and, and be out. And the reason we wanted you out of there by 9 is, that, I don't know if you've noticed, but them winds get to whipping up sometime afternoon and, and then the fire starts to pick up and really starts to rage after that and then it blows up and, and things go kind of wild for us. So we, we've wanted you out of there. And we've sure appreciated the fact that when you go in, you've checked in and, and you've helped us by coming back out and checking out so that we know that you've, you've got out of there. And we don't have to spend extra time with our resources to go in and find you because you don't know whether you've had any problems or not. So if you'll, if you'll keep that up, uh, that'll be helpful for us and hopefully it's help for, helpful for you. Tomorrow, if things go well, we'll get a brief in the morning, see what their progress was overnight, uh, and see if they've established some more line in there to make it, to make it safe. If, if the weather's good, if the winds are right, we'll allow some individuals to go back in there and, and, and take care of those. We're going to restrict area two that we've evacuated tomorrow. And uh, because we're having some difficulties with the firefighters getting into some of those roads and uh, some of the public traveling those roads, we don't want any accidents. There's some hot spots in there that, that jump. So we're gonna restrict area, vac second evacuation area tomorrow, number two, back. And, and if things look good, we'll do, number th we'll do number three, which is closer to starvation. We're taking that starvation bridge area back to the west to, uh, to Sam's Wash. The way we'll do that, just so you'll know so there won't be any confusion, is that uh, we'll launch a, a time just like we did the last two days, give you a time frame. We'll have you check in at the end of town this time by the gateway. We'll have you check in there and check out there so we can keep track of you and know that you didn't get in there and you know, have an accident or get caught in the fire or, or whatever it might be. And uh, hopefully that'll work out okay. It's evacuated from, from, it's actually evacuated from Current Creek on the south side of the road. Plum, yeah, plum to the uh, Strawberry River Road and the Strawberry River Road. The one by Duchesne. So it's close to the reservoir. So, and I, I understand, it seems a little extreme, but if you've seen them fires move, I think you'll, I think you'll understand it a little bit. And we'll take a few more questions after, after Mike uh, addresses you, but I hope that gives you a little bit perspective what, what we're dealing with. We've manned a lot of roadblocks. And uh, part of that is, uh, is to make sure that you're safe. But the other part is, we don't want somebody coming in there and looting your property. You've left it, you know, somewhat unattended, obviously. So we've manned them roadblocks and we've done, uh, assigned several officers to patrol those areas. And if they see anything suspicious at all, even if they see you at your property, they're gonna, they're gonna come and talk to you because we don't want anybody, we wanna minimize the, the potential of somebody going in there and taking, you know, your property that uh, is unattended. I understand that, and we're, and we're trying to do that, so thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's hard to follow for me there. I 
I've had the opportunity to work with the sheriff for a lot of years. Um, and he truly not only cares about the law enforcement part of this, but individual people. And he's taught me a lot throughout being able to work with him for a long time, and I appreciate that. My job as fire and emergency manager for Duchesne County is to not only uh, try to fight these fires and work with the fire departments on these fires throughout all of the county, but as emergency management to try to put together an emergency operation plan for you, uh, for the counties, for the, the people around there to, uh, to, to try to provide the needs and stuff that we need when emergencies like this come up. We understand that, that some of the stuff that comes up as fast as this runs and those things that's is going as fast as they are, it's hard to keep up with it sometimes. But with working with all the people that we've been able to work with and bringing the stuff together from the very beginning, they've been great to work with, they've been great to come together with everything that we need to try to protect and, and help you guys. Um, as it was mentioned before, our number one priority always is the responder and public safety. And that's what we hope that we can accomplish. Uh, like they talked about a few minutes ago, The losses are hard. Um, I've been in this job for a long time, and I've seen loss that, that's hard to deal with. And I understand that. I, I understand it from seeing it, and I, it's, it's hard for that. But at the same time, if we can provide the safety for the responders and the public that nobody gets hurt and, and gets through this, hopefully at the end of it, uh, we can learn, and my emergency operation plan can learn from that and we can grow like we do every time something happens and do better next time. Um, the cooperators that we've been able to work with and bring together in this have been so awesome. The, the phone calls that we've needed to make to get the help and the support to come along with it, uh, nobody hesitated. It was, it was almost immediately, right from the very beginning when I had the opportunity to be involved in the beginning of this with Wasatch County and with uh, the cooperators that was trying to, to see what was going on with this when it first started. Everybody was so good all through this whole thing to, to try to do the best we could to provide what we could for the, the responders and the, and the public out there. And so uh, my hope is that, that we can continue to do what we're doing and keep safe from all of this and, and be able to provide the protection that needs for you guys and hopefully keep it as small as we can. And I do appreciate everybody here that's been involved with this, and we'll do the best we can for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You know, as I mentioned, uh, we're a type one incident management team, and we travel all over the country. Uh, so national meeting that we can go anywhere. I can think just recently, we were in Montana last year, Colorado a few years ago but Florida, kind of all over the place. And one of the things that we really hope for when we go to a local jurisdiction like this is to have county folks like these folks. Uh, and it's not the case all the time, but especially the Mike, job that Mike has done and, and Troy have done on the emergency uh, management standpoint, you know, a huge thank you from the Type 1 team to you guys, because you guys are rocking it. Good job, okay? All right, now if we can think about all the natural disasters that have taken place over time, there's always one organization that's there to do the stuff that needs to be done, to really help folks. Um, you know, we have a technical jargon for them, we call them non-governmental agencies, GMOs, or man, that's just crazy stuff, okay? But in reality, it's the American Red Cross. Um, and I'd like to give the opportunity, absolutely, thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Gary Robinson uh, to say a few words as well, too. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. As you said, I'm Gary Robinson. I'm with the uh, American Red Cross. I'm a volunteer. So we try our best to do the best we can. I just want to read a little something to you. It says, the American Red Cross, through a strong network of volunteers, donors, and partners, is always there in times of need. We aspire to, to turn compassion into action so that all people affected by disaster across the country and around the world receive care, shelter, and hope. What we've seen here, what we've seen here since we've been on the ground is that that's what you've done to one another. I travel across the, the U.S., but Utah is unique. Unique because you guys take care of one another. 
Yeah. And that's for you. And that's for you. So we thank you so much for letting us in to just be boots on the ground. We're learning so much from you. We're kind of jealous, as a matter of fact, because you guys are taking care of one another. But we hope to be here not only for the response, but for the recovery. We hope to be able to, to leverage some of the uh, resources that we have to help you. So if you're affected by this disaster, make sure that you sign in and, and let us know who you are. Because when this is over, we hope to, to again, help you uh, in the recovery with the resources that we have. And again, thank you. Thank you. And also, if you'd like to volunteer with the Red Cross, go to redcross.org. We'd love to have every last one of you because you guys are amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take a few minutes um, to answer some questions. Now, um, I know it's hot in here, and we've been here for almost an hour, so uh, we are committed to staying here as long as you guys would like to, but I know some of you folks want to get out of here. Um, over on this map, over on this wall, um, after we're done with the formal part right here, we'll have our fire operations and our, our agency folks over here at this map. Over at this map over here, we're going to put our county folks. Um, so if there's an opportunity, you guys have a question for the county side or uh, uh, the fire management side, we'll kind of set things up that way. Uh, but let's take a few questions right now um, and uh, see where we go. Okay, Let's start right here. I was just saying thank you to all of you guys. You guys have done a great job. But I heard you just talk about Area 2 um, tomorrow. We're from Salt Lake, and there's a few people here I know that are from Salt Lake that make that drive. To, that when you first gave, came out and said that you were going to let us down, we, we have a cabin on uh, Lower Red Creek Road. We, on uh, Wednesday, we were told that you were going to allow us down. We were called to make sure that was true, and we were told that you were not letting us down on that side of the road. So we turned around and came home. This morning we got your message again that you were letting us out to go down that road. We drove as quick as we could right when you got there and we were turned away, which I understand the wind turned up. But now, so we just got a room to stay here so we won't have to make that drive again in the morning. But if I understand you right, you're just saying that Lower Red Creek Road's off limits tomorrow? That's true, and, and I understand that, you know, that you've traveled a long ways, twice, and uh, in that area too. I know there's others out there probably like that. We want to accommodate you as, as best we can and still make sure that we're not interfering with any of the, uh, the efforts with the firefighters. Some of the things that we experienced today was, uh, you know, and it, it isn't necessarily anybody's, anybody's fault, it's just the way it is. There's only a certain amount of roads that, that come in there. And if individuals are traveling them roads and they have to hurry and get up a road because they need to uh, respond to a particular area or not and it's clogged up or there's somebody there, one thing, the, these guys are trying to, to get there in a hurry and they're not always, pardon me, but they're, they're not always watching, uh, you know, being as safe as they could, I guess, on the road because there really shouldn't be anybody on there. They're expecting there not to be anybody on there, and then here's a, here's a vehicle coming down a one-lane road, and they come around a, a bend, and, and they take you out. So I understand that. If you have traveled a long area, and you're staying the night, get with my, my uh, team in the morning. Uh, you can meet us out there where uh, we're letting them, them through, if that happens. I'm not sure that that will even happen. We'll have to see what it looks like tonight with their efforts. Um, and, and the way the weather uh, reacts. And so if you have, meet us out there. Let's look at where your property is. We'll get out the map. We'll look where your property is. And, it, and if it looks good and we can facilitate that, we will. I can't make any promises, but we'll try. Like I say, I, I've been evacuated before. I've been sitting right there where you have. And, uh, you know, and, and needing to go in and take care of animals and stuff and, and see what was going on and get medication. And it's frustrating. I, I, I cussed the officers for not letting us in, and it's not fair, and, 
and other people's being let in and we're not. So I understand. Um, and we'll accommodate you as best as we can. But I can't make any promises to you. Um, as we looked at this, I'm going to give you just a, a little perspective on, on what we're dealing with. We have over 3,000 parcels of property out there. 3,000. And, uh, you know, we have a large number of individuals here with properties. Um, but it's a fraction of what's out there. We have uh, been inundated with calls and can we go in here and go in there. Uh, some individuals wanted to go right on the fire line and check stuff, you know, and, and that's, just not, that's just totally out of the question. But we have 3,000 parcels. We only have so much personnel to go around. And so, like I say, we're trying to facilitate it as best as we can. Be patient with us and, and, we, and we'll do the best we can uh, with what we have. Uh, I've never seen my officers so tired. They put in a lot of hours on my search and rescue guys. And uh, while I'm up here, I'm just going to mention to you, I have a public information person, Jeff Lasick. We hired him a year ago. And he has been such an asset to us trying to get information out to you. I, ho I hope you've seen that on our sheriff's page. He has answered so many calls and tried to respond to so many text messages. Uh, he calls me at 5 o'clock this morning and says, I, I can't even sleep. I'm getting so, you know, he's getting in it and he's trying to answer those and, uh, and, and take care of the information that we have and get it out to you. So, uh, again, be patient with us. We'll try to work with you as best we can. If you find yourself in that situation, be there tomorrow and, and we'll, we'll try to facilitate as best as we can. Okay? Um, so we're going to pass the mic over to you, just so uh, Judith, right here. Yeah, let's pass it over here, and we can ask that question as well again. <laughs> just going to torch you a little bit. I'll go ahead and take it, actually. Uh, it's a button that's on the bottom right there. But the question is, is there going to be any FEMA relief um, as a part of this uh, uh, incident that's taking place? Okay. So, you know, one of the things that we like to do is can be completely as honest as we are, as we possibly can. And it looks like we're not sure of that at this point. A couple things have taken place in the state which really uh, sets the gear in motion that those things can take place. Uh, your governor did declare a statewide state of emergency, and that does open the door for some federal assistance to come in. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I think at some point in time, uh, we'll have liaisons that, that work, that come to us, probably tie into the team uh, that are from FEMA, and we'll start talking about those aspects. But we don't know the answer to that yet. Okay? Okay? Let's just go right next to you. Over here, Judith. Hello. Okay. I'm 500 miles away, bridging with my family here. Uh, we are right next to the water dispensary, just, on, just west of the bridge on the north side. I'd like to know, because we have situations here with illness, and um, we have a dog that's going on us, and so we have a lot to contend with this, that as well. I have my husband that is planning coming from uh, Nevada, and uh, he has 500 miles to come. I figure that probably it would be over Indian Canyon would be the best for him to come. But I need to kind of give him an idea what to expect. And because we have these situations in our family and we're so close to that possible evacuation point, I would like to know how are we notified? And uh, I just don't know what to expect there. We have things in the front porch area ready to go, but I want to know how are we are notified so that we can get out when we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deshane County, I, I believe she was talking about Deshane County specifically. So how are you going to be notified? Okay, the, the way we've done that is you'll be, one, personally notified, because you'll have a deputy or a search and rescue member on your doorstep saying, you know, 
there's a potential of you being evacuated. Now that's just a potential, it's just kind of heads up. Um, that could happen. And hopefully that gives you a little bit of time to, to deal with that. Obviously if you've got stuff out on your porch ready to go, great. That's what we, that's what we, we want. You want me to be prepared. That's why we give you a little bit of a heads up in advance. Um, secondly, on our Facebook page, we've been trying to push that out as fast as we can. And uh, it's being pushed out on our other media sources, uh, on the news and stuff. There's a code red system that we send out that uh, we're evacuating this area. If we do a pre-evacuation, you'll be notified. We've, we've been trying to go around and notify you personally that that's happening. That, we, we are on Rocky Ridge, yes. the old, old property. Yes. We, we, we have maps out and we can see the roads and stuff and, and, and so we'll, we'll get to you. You're in an area on the north side, closer to the lake, so the chances of you being uh, evacuated are certainly slimmer than those individuals that's up next to Current Creek. Right. But you, it's, it's wise to still be prepared and uh, we don't want to leave anybody behind. Definitely don't. We've had individuals in our experience so far where we've had two uh, that were homebound uh, on hospice. And so we have went in there with uh, uh, an escort of officers and ambulance and got those individuals out. And we'll do what we need to to, to, to get you out of there and, and not leave anybody behind. Does that help? Thank you, uh, thank you Sheriff. Mike, Mike uh, Leffler is going to add a little bit to that as well. If I may, this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about what the sheriff said about Code Red. Um, I don't know of how many of you have heard of that. We've tried to put that out there. We've tried to advertise that in Duchesne County before. It's actually throughout the region, uh, Region 5 out here. If you haven't heard of it, please contact my office. If you have access to the Internet, please look on uh, Duchesne County's website. It's on the front page of that. Uh, if you have access to your cell phones, if you have access to a home phone, whatever that may be, I would encourage you to go on that and sign up on Code Red and put that information in there so when this does happen, they ha we have the capability through the Sheriff's Office, through Central Dispatch, through areas to be able to circle these areas and get that message out to you guys as soon as we have to so it covers everybody that signed up on that. So if you haven't heard of it, if you haven't seen it, if you are, that's great, we appreciate that. If you haven't heard of it or seen it, if you don't find it on the website or have any questions about it, please contact my office. Thank you. Thanks again, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump over to the back here real quick. Um, yeah, so right back there, Judith, with her hand up. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that some of us only know these areas by mile markers, um, and so it would be really helpful if you guys threw that out there. I live on the south side closest to starvation, and two days ago we got an evacuation immediately and we ran. Since then, we were told that we could go back in, and we did. We went back in, and since then, I've been told that I'm not supposed to be in there. So I don't know if I'm supposed to be in there. I don't think half these people know if they're allowed to go back in or what they're supposed to be doing. So I'm just really needing some clarification. I'm between mile marker 79 and 80 um, on that south side there. So I don't know if I'm supposed to be there, if I can go back in there. Um, so let me let me offer a couple of little bits of assistance. So um, on the team side, we're going to produce a map that um, shows the evacuation area. And thanks, we will put those mile markers in there too. I, I also grew up in a town that has no street signs. I couldn't tell you what street I grew up on. but So we'll add the mile markers to that. But Sheriff, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No? Okay. So you're at mile marker 78, right? Just 79, 79 just this side of the uh, west side of the reservoir. Okay. Do you know where the Strawberry River Road is? Are you on the east side or the west side? Okay. You shouldn't be in there. That's an evacuation area. Yeah, you were evacuated. They said probably. What, excuse me. The east side. Then you're you're fine. Yep, you're fine. If you're with, if you're on the outside, on the east side of the Strawberry River Road that drops down, makes the swing in the bottom, 
and goes back towards the pinnacles. If you're on that east side, you're good. So you're good. Okay. Thanks, Chair. A gentleman back here has had us. Yep, thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank all of you for whatever thing you do. And uh, I just have a question on the Strawberry Pinnacles. Can you give us an update on uh, those 79 properties in there? I know you've, nobody's letting anybody in. I understand that, you know, 79 people trying to get in at once. But is it, is it, second question, is it possible we could send one representative from the HOA in there to see what's going on, to see if any of these properties have been damaged? Okay. So was the first part that you wanted to know more information about we the We want some fire? more information on the strawberry pinnacles. We've heard a lot of different things. We've heard they've all been wiped out. We've heard they're good. We don't know. We Okay. So if we're talking about structures, um, uh, so I think, we, I think we have some next information. Next to Camelot. The next property to Camelot. next to Camelot. Okay. So I think we can just share some. Did you want a little more information about the fire activity in there that's going on right no, now? No, we want to know if those structures are still there. Okay. Mike, do you want to take this and, yeah. Oh, we're going to go this way first. Um, so I know this is not going to answer your question um, immediately, but I did meet with the uh, state FMO today and his area FMO, and they're putting together an assessment team to go into all the areas um, that were impacted by fire and um, get a good handle on what's, what's been impacted, where, what the status is, that type of thing. Um, so they're putting that team together now. I, I'm not sure when we'll be able to give you a solid answer um, from that perspective. But what I do know, coming down, that it's down that lower Red Creek Road or in that area down to Camelot, correct? Right, down Camelot. Oh, okay. Um, to my knowledge, um, everything is, is fine in that area um, with where the, what the fire is, and that's why we're focusing our efforts in there is to keep that, that fire out of that whole area and coming down that road. What the, next, the other question was, I, I appreciate everything on what you've been saying in that. Could we send one representation, re representative down there from the HOA to, okay. to see this tomorrow? Or Okay, let me, let me do a little bit. So, you know, we have technical terms for, you know, evaluating homes, and one of those is we call them damage assessment. Um, so Mike, again, from, from the county emergency management, he has a plan to start getting those things going. So let's have him talk a little bit about that, and then perhaps we can talk about uh, his, his question about one person getting in. Thank you. Uh, talk a little bit about damage assessment. Um, to begin with, the reason a lot of some of this hasn't been done already is, is in working with the team and working with everybody else, we need to make sure it's safe for us as well as the firefighters and the people going in to, to look at some of these areas. In conversation with the team today, in conversation with the state, and in, in with other individuals, we're, pre, we're planning in the planning process of this right now to be able to get in some of these areas approved by the team right now that we can go in and start doing some damage assessment starting hopefully as soon as tomorrow. But that's going to, again, depend on what areas we can get into safely and assess those, that stuff and put that information together for you. So uh, it, it, again, we're gonna try to start on that tomorrow based on what the team team's direction is where we can go and hopefully build on that and if we can get in some of those areas we'll do as much of it as we can over the next few days all right then um, as far as the part about your question I think just coordination uh, continue coordination with the uh, with the sheriff's department um, on that particular question so you know I think the answer is right now based on the fire information or the fire activity that's taking place in there it's probably not going to happen soon but, but I think perhaps something could be arranged um, between the county and uh, kind of a representative from the area to take a peek in there, okay? So I know it's getting late. Let's just do one more question and then we'll kind of split from there. We'll kind of split from there and hang around as much as you guys would like to. Uh, so Judith, let's go to this lady right here. Thank you. I'm just wondering what the next steps are for those who have lost property. Okay. Next steps for those who have lost property. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that Gary Robinson does have some information on that and experience that he's had in the past as well, too. Um, so let's, Gary, if you want to give it a shot. Sure. If you've lost property, 
please let us know. You know, so we can we can help you out with uh, the resources that we have. So, uh, a gentleman had a, a question about FEMA also. You know, right now FEMA is the grant money is being used to help the the firefighter situation, and so we take it one step at a time. I'm not FEMA, of course, but we take it one step at a time. And uh, if they can help you, they will. But they are a government agency, all right. And so you know how that goes, all right. <laughs> Just telling you the truth. But uh, again, we, we want to make sure that we, we help you and anyone else here that, that may need help uh, and you lost property. Please get with us and let us know. We'll close out with another Red Cross person here. Yeah, um, there used to be or may still be an Air Force Reserve C-130 firefighting unit in Colorado. Okay. Have they been activated? Okay, so a question on aerial assets. Um, so I can do a little bit of generally, might, you might have some more specific information, but um, so what we call uh, a MAFS, uh, a military aircraft that's used as a tanker. Right. Um, we train those folks up throughout the year, and then at certain planning levels, um, they are mobilized and become part of the fleet uh, that, that is used nationwide to, to be air tankers. Tony, they are up right now? Okay. Okay, yeah, so based on the level of, of, uh, of uh, operational readiness that we're in, yeah. uh, Tony's confirming that they are up and operational now. Okay, yeah, but not in this area? Not particularly yeah. in this area okay. right now. Because yeah. the fire you had a number of years ago, I had called the commander, and he said he's waiting to be called up. I called the governor's office sure. and mentioned it to them because he's the only one and he has to call the president. As far as I know, they never got called up. Okay, you know, just based on my experience over the last, gosh, about 35 years, um, you know, the MAFS units that we put into place are key assets, um, and we put them into work, you know, into the system and, and work them as quickly as we possibly can. So um, they do a great job for us, actually, okay? So let's go ahead and end at that point right now. And again, if you guys would like to stay around, We'll have kind of firefighting operations over here, questions for a county over here. Uh, but I really want to thank you guys for coming tonight, and I really want to give you guys a hand for doing the great job that you guys have done. Okay, one last note real quick is, is we most likely will have another public meeting. We'll talk about when that will take place, and we'll be sure to get that information out to you. Thanks. <laughs>